Hi, this is Scott Miller. Welcome to my top performance blog. I have the pleasure today of speaking with a researcher from the Netherlands, Bram Bovendert, who with colleagues has just published a study on systematic client feedback. And I'm really grateful to you, Bram, that you'd spend a few minutes with me talking about your results. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And yeah. Bram, this particular article appeared in what is widely considered one of the top two psychotherapy research journals on the planet. And we know that because next to the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, the journal called Psychotherapy Research is actually fairly difficult to get to, to get your article published in. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It, it was hard, but it was also, I, I was very lucky with the reviewers because they were very helpful too. So they, uh, and you always say that, but they really did improve the final article. So it was, it was difficult, but helpful too. So I, I'm, I'm glad it got published and it's, uh, it's open access even so anyone can read it. So I like that. Yeah. And it, that is, it's open access. And so at the bottom of the screen, there is a link so that you can click on it and read the actual study. And of course, feedback informed work that is using some routine measures to assess progress or the relationship and then feeding that information back to the therapist and client in real time is a hot topic in psychotherapy at the present time. Yeah, sure. I, I agree, but I, I think it's it's often thought of as a quick fix. So you just train some people and then you all agree, well, let's do it from now. Um, but that, that it doesn't work that way, I guess. I think it's a it's an implementing process. It's about a behavioral change of, of therapists, I guess. And that's as hard as a behavioral change of a, of a patient or a client, I, I think it's the it's the same. To to me, it's getting feedback is is uh, trying to get more personalized medicine, personalized psychotherapy, and it starts with the agreement. Okay, let's let's go on a journey to implement this. But it, in, in the early days, it was thought of as a quick quick fix. So, mm. uh, just just fill in some forms and then it will all get better. Mm. I don't think it works that way. So, yeah. It's been my experience as well, Bram, that it doesn't work that way. And I think in a way, having the measures face forward in the discussion led people to believe that somehow it would, if you just administered these measures. That idea struck me always as a bit absurd. We, we don't expect runners to run faster simply because somebody has a stopwatch, for example. Well, wow, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So it, it can be helpful, but it takes some time to implement. And it's, uh, it's, it's somewhat disturbing therapy in the way that if, if you look at the, the outcome rating scale, it's, it's asked about the same questions my neighbor can ask me. How are you? How are your wife and the children and how else work? So it, it looks a bit like the same conversation, but in therapy, the, the conversation has a higher purpose. It, it, it must, we must achieve some goals, some better uh, improving well-being, for instance. And I think in adding feedback to therapy, you are saying to yourself and your client, no, it's, I'm not the friendly neighbor. It's uh, not just a conversation. This conversation has to lead to something. And it's sometimes a bit disturbing because sometimes people are just also a bit lonely and they, they just want to talk to a friendly face. And sure, that, that's nice, but it's also therapy. And then there is more than just talking to a friendly person, I, I guess. Right. It has to have some kind of result. And so... Tell us a bit about your study. For example, what measures were used? I used a, a PCOM system or FIT. So the, the outcome rating skill and session rating skill as a, I, I think it's, it's an intervention. So it's not just measuring, but it's talking about 
the measurement, talking what, what would we discuss today in therapy, so your overall well-being will improve. Afterwards, this, what can we do better next time? Mm. So, and that we use as the intervention, and we use the um, the outcome questionnaire and the um, uh, the mental health uh, continuous form as a measurement to see. We had two centers that were uh, giving treatment as usual, and two centers who were giving treatment as usual added with PCOMs or FIT, and then we the, we use the OQ45 and the uh, mental health continuum short form as measurements. Is there a difference between those centers? And we also right. studied if there are a difference in dropout and in cost and duration. So. And how many clients and how many practitioners are we talking about? We did uh, two analysis. One, the, the intention to treat, so that, that's including all the patients, not to rule or effectively give, uh, getting systematic client feedback, but who are intended to get feedback. And those were 1,733 patients, so a lot. It's um, a lot. So yeah. this is adequately powered study, as they say. Yeah, yeah, in the yeah. Field. Um, um, it took a lot of chocolate to the therapists, <laughs> a, a lot of work, but um, well, actually we, we were going on a process, so we didn't just train the, the the therapists, about 12 therapists in, in overall, but we followed up every month we went to those therapists and uh, also in the, the treatment as usual condition, the, the, we, we went and what's going on, how are you doing, what's helping, uh, what, what are your problems? So we went on for a process for two years uh, and then we could, of course, then we could include a lot of patients. And this, yeah. this means, and believe me, I, I know the amount of work involved in conducting a research study, which, by the way, has no guarantee that you're going to find out anything you really wanted to find out. I know. But it, what you're saying is that you were providing ongoing support. This wasn't some one hour or one day workshop where they were trained to administer the measures. You were supporting them throughout. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that is necessary. As I was saying, you, you also say implementing is a, is a process, not, not just an agreement. The agreement is a starting point. Just mm -hmm. as you, if you want to live more healthier, then you, you can say to yourself, oh, I'm going to work out, and then you do it for two or three weeks, and then it all goes down. But when you include it in your daily practice, in your daily uh, things you do, then you will improve health. And to implement uh, feedback systematically in treatment as usual, it takes on a process, I think, of several years. You, you know Heidi Bradland, she, she even in, uh, studied this and, and uh, the, the effectiveness of feedback got better throughout the years of implementation. So, right. Yeah. Right. And I, I really like your analogy to exercise or changing your eating habits. This isn't something you have a one visit on and then somehow it magically transforms your life. We're asking, <laughs> we're, we're asking clinicians to really adjust how they've been accustomed to working. Take feedback, make sense of it with the client, respond and react by doing something different in the room. And, mm. and that's that's also training in having an open, self-reflecting mind and, and acknowledging that you don't have all the answers and that you know maybe four or five things that can work with, for instance, a depression, but you don't know if it works for the clients who is in your room. So um, that's, that's also sort of take some adjustment, not, oh, I know what's going on, you have to do this. No, it's, it's more difficult than that more challenging. Also. Right. And so, Bram, what are the two or three key findings from your particular study? Well, the, the main finding was that it really was helpful adding feedback to treatment as usual. It, it gave an additional outcome improvement of 25%. So that's, that's huge because even in the, the treatment as usual centers, they had a, a significant improvement, but 
on top of that, there was a 25% additional improvement. So that, that was the main finding. And then we looked also at uh, the, the therapy length, so the duration, but, and there, there were no, there was no additional improvement. But I think you can't have it all. That, that we did an, an analysis. There was another study by, led by Pauline Janssen, and she she found that uh, it shortened therapy, but there was no additional improvement. So I think you either have can have additional outcome improvement or shorten your therapy. But okay, feedback it, it, it can be helpful, but if it shortens therapy and gets therapy better, that's that's asking for too much, I guess. The third finding was uh, we also looked at dropout and we didn't find a significant effect of dropout. It was nearly significant. Dropout rates were already low. So, um, but in, in the feedback condition, uh, it was there was a, a difference, but not significant. It was 0 0.078. So not zero, five, zero five. but, but actually, I, I don't know if you know that, um, but I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it. We did an also study in, in the forensic psychiatry, a pilot study on dropout, also adding uh, PCOMs or FIT. And there we found a very significant effect in reducing dropout rates. So that's, that's, that's impressive. Is that published yet? Yeah, but it's, it's a pilot study, so it's only studied in, in the Dutch Journal of uh, Psychotherapy. We, we added uh, Marlene Janssen, led that research, but um, led that study. Uh, it actually had two impressive outcomes, I, I guess, because it very significantly uh, reduced dropout, but it also improved treatment retention. So these were patients who were uh, ordered by court to go to therapy. And they, when PCOMS was added, they uh, frequently, more frequently visited their therapist. Even it was, at the start, it was involuntary, but somehow they, uh, they get, got to therapy more often. So, and it's, it's published, but it's a pilot study. It's a bit smaller. It's a bit smaller, but it's, it's interesting, I, I think. When you think about the research on feedback, and in particular, your study, what would you say is the next frontier? What is it that researchers need to be looking at next in order to, in order to provide the best information to practitioners who really want to do the best by their clients? Well, I'm working on a next paper on therapist effects, therapeutic characteristics, and because in, in the, the main study, there was a large difference between the two centers. One center was doing feedback almost uh, a lot of times. And the other center, they were, at the beginning, they were quite enthusiastic to start with uh, adding feedback to PCOMs, but then they, some of them got ill. So they, their total number of therapists uh, decreased. And then they just tried to be the minimal requirements of a treatment and they had no room to to add something new and in, in my paper I, I talked about a, 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 the culture was good they 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 were they thought yeah feedback will can be helpful but the climate changed because it wasn't a, a good climate to to start with adding pecans so mm. and in, in uh, the paper I'm working on now, then their perception of the validity of feedback changed. So before some of the therapists got ill, they all thought, yeah, this can be useful and uh, this, this will add. But then they, they had a lot of workload. So, and then they, they, they even that changed their perception. They, they thought, ah, oh, no, this, this, I don't think this will be helpful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. So um, the context influences how yeah, we interpret yeah. things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, well, yeah. I have to publish it yet, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I think, so think of what are therapist factors? What are the, the perceived validity of a feedback scale? Mm. What are organizational factors? I think that all uh, is the mix that, that finally, that, that 
determines the final result. So, and yeah. I know that my own group, uh, together with Jesse Owen, another researcher at the University of Denver, we're looking at data from a very large implementation here in the United States in a networked system rather than an in-house staff model system. Yeah. So there are multiple threats because there's no central organization to keeping people focused. What we found is that of the people who dropped out, who stopped using the tools, the number one thing they said was, I didn't see them as adding much of anything to my work. In a way, it's a question about validity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or perceived validity, I guess. That's exactly yeah. right, perceived yeah. validity. So, Bram, if there's one takeaway that you could offer clinicians that are either thinking about or currently doing feedback-informed treatment, what would that be? One piece of advice or counsel? I think uh, just try it out. Even uh, maybe you try it out the first five sessions. So you can get used to feedback. And then then I, I mostly therapists change when they 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 uh, they perceive the added value. Then they have a client and they, they, they look at the skills and they say, oh. I didn't think of that. I wouldn't come up with this if I hadn't had feedback. And so uh, try it a bit, have a little taste of it. That's mm. if you're confused, shall I do it? Well, okay, just try it. A few clients, first five sessions. That I think that would be a good start. Perfect. Brom, thanks so much for spending time with me and congratulations on this important study, which adds to the growing understanding of how we can listen to our clients and as a result, deliver more effective care. Thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, take care.